Rules of Thought Induction The student of the subject of thought power, when he begins to realize the fact that thoughts are radioactive and that they possess inductive power, he usually finds himself wondering why all persons, by both kinds, are not completely overcome by the thought of the thought and influences surrounding and exerting their power upon them. He marvels at the fact that anyone can escape the thought induction of the thought atmosphere, but his observation and common sense informs him that most persons seem to be comparatively free from such influences, except in exceptional cases and under unusual conditions. This reflection brings the student to the point where he seeks for and finds certain general rules governing the phenomena of thought induction. These general rules we shall now present to you. 1. Protective Immunity Nature operates in the direction of protecting living creatures from influences threatening them injury. So far as is possible, she interposes a protective shield between the creature and the adverse influence. The major, finding the creature persistently frightened by influences which have proved themselves to be dangerous to the welfare of the species or class to which the creature belongs, begins to build up and establish what is called the protective community of the creature to the particular influence. By reason of this natural tendency, the human race is now immune from certain diseases which thoroughly seriously frightened it. Each generation acquires an additional degree of this immunity. Our leading reference work says, Immunity may be described as the state or condition of an individual who is persistent or non susceptible to a particular infection. There is no such thing as absolute immunity. More animals or individuals may seem under natural conditions to be immune to certain diseases, yet, when they are placed in an unfavorable environment, by when the natural vigor is lowered by climate or insufficient food, they succumb to diseases to which they are ordinarily immune. In the same way, nature operates in the direction of protecting us from the perception of consciousness of certain sounds, sights, smells, and other sensations, which serve no useful purpose to us but which would serve to distract our attention from more useful reports of the senses. For instance, we are conscious of but a very small percentage of the things which our eyes see on the streets of a busy city, our ears who see the multitude of sounds which our consciousness fails to register. We become so accustomed to familiar odors that we fail to perceive them, and in a like manner, we fail to register the greater portion of the five vibrations which are beating upon us from all sides. But at all times, were it not so, we would never be able to think at all on our own account, or to have a mind of our own. It is only the exceptional, not the ordinary thought of foods which reach us, and by self training. We may still further limit these exceptional influences. In fact, they may be stated as a general principle that we are strongly affected by thought induction proceeding from the radio or to thought of others fully when our natural immunity to these is lacking, or when it is overbalanced by certain strong attractive powers in our own minds. These conditions are always, for the most part, from some of the following causes. Those. 1. General lack of resistive power of our own thoughts, arising from a lack of strong convictions and ideas of our own, which are close to those involved in the thought vibrations we chose from others. 2. 
general agreement on harmony with the outside vital vibrations, which operate on the principle of like attracts like. They usually attract and draw such thought influences to us, while we least open the gates of our minds to their influx. 3. General belief in, while I feel concerning, the power of the outside thought influences to reach us. The confident expectation of earnest belief or well, deep fear is practically the same thing, and, in either case, it opens the gates of our minds to the thought influences in question. 2. Neutralization. Thought vibrations are subject to a process of neutralization, by means of which they are deprived so much of their strength and inductive power when they come in contact with thought vibrations of an opposite character, either in the minds of individuals or in the general not having share of persons and places. False. When a current of thought vibration comes in contact with an individual of strong, positive ideas and convictions of an opposite character, the current is weakened by the contact and conflict and loses its power to influence him or the individual or others. In the same way, thought currents are weakened or neutralized by contact with strong, positive thought vibrations of an opposite character and the thought atmosphere of a place. On the other hand, however, if the new thought vibrations being accorded with the original current, the later receives fresh strength and power. The mental atmosphere of every place of public meeting, you know, the every place in which numbers of persons live, is constantly filled with thought waves, thought currents, thought streams, and thought forms, all made up and composed of thought vibrations of numerous persons drawn together by the force of their mutual attraction. These streams of thought vibrations, of course, are constantly coming in contact with each other. When this happens, a certain process is set up, in which usually occurs either combination and blooming of harmonious elements, or else the neutralization of their anomalous elements. In the process of neutralization, a certain definite ratio is found to maintain. For instance, if the two opposing forces are of about the same degree of power and energy, they chose practically an equal amount of inductive strength by reason of the neutralization. But if they differ in comparative power and energy, they will lose in the inverse ratio of their relative strength. The stronger will lose less and the weaker will lose more. Thus, if one of the opposing forces is twice the power of over, they will lose only half as much as does the weaker one. But in each and every case of neutralization, there is a loss on both sides. This being so, it follows that the individual coming in common fight with strong opposing thought influences, thus who punish his own dark power by pouring into it a stream of strong, positive ideas representing his own convictions, principles, or beliefs. This process of neutralization is also manifested in the process of treatment of things, places, or conditions on the part of the followers of mental science. Here, the adverse, undesirable, negative thought atmospheres are neutralized and dissipated by turning upon them a steady, and repelling stream of positive, good thought vibrations. 3. Rhythm in a preceding section, we have spoken of the whirlwinds of thought vibrations, which sometimes pass rapidly over a crowd, a community, or even over a whole country, or at times over the entire civilized world. These mental whirlwinds, starting from a focal center, spread rapidly in the ever widening circumference of the circles, and with an ever increasing force and power. That is, ever widening and ever increasing, but to a certain point. Sooner or later, however, the influence of the outside for opposing it, combined with the natural rhythm which is found in all natural activities, serves to slow down the movement and to dissipate its strength. Everything in nature has its rise and its fall, its increase and its decrease. It's better than it's tough. And these thought rulings or whirlpools come under the general law. If you have studied the history of mental epidemics, crises, or other phases of extinct thought contagion, 
you perceive the operation of this law of rhythm, this tendency to regain and restore the moral balance between the opposing poles of things. In the instances cited in the preceding chapter, you will note the gradual or rapid decline of the contagion following which lies to its highest point. You may also see the possible manifested in any case of popular excitement, such as, for instance, the great trilogy survival, the political campaign, the war, and any other form of mental excitement in which a large number of persons are affected. From the stages of intense, burning, ardour, excitement, or even frenzy, there is a corresponding slowing down and growing off. The reaction follows the action and is equal to it, though in an opposite direction. Were those points fell on an operation, there would be no room to the spread and increase in force of a mental epidemic. They would veritably consume the world with its intensity. Four, harmonious attraction. As we have informed you in the preceding sections of this book, there is manifest in the world of thought vibrations a certain strong attraction between thought waves or thought hurts in the minds of those persons whose general thought and feeling are more or less in harmonious agreement with those represented in the thought hurts. Like attracts like, birds of a feather thought together. My own shall come to me. All these statements are illustrated by the actions of the thought hurts in response to the drawing power of the mind. Persons of strong convictions, right or wrong, good or bad, are constantly attracting to themselves the thought hurts of other persons of similar convictions. Likewise, persons of certain strong emotional states, affections, desires, passions and inclinations are constantly drawing to themselves the thought hurts of other persons of similar natures. We are connected by in those movement links and filaments with others of similar thoughts and emotional states, similar natures and characters. Our thoughts and their thoughts have an elective affinity for each other. Each draws and attracts the thought hurts of others of the same general character. We are constantly forming and maintaining mental partnerships in this way. We should be careful what kind of partners we join with in this thought relation. Do you have been drawing thought hurts of an undesirable nature? Do you should take mental stock of yourself for the purpose of discovering and eradicating those thoughts and other mental states which have proved to be the magnet drawn to you this undesirable crowd of thought influences. You should then replace these objectionable mental states with thoughts and mental states of a desirable character. You may deliberately attract and draw to yourself the most desirable kinds of thoughts and mental states. You may have any kind of mental partner that you desire. If you will but establish a fair slumber of the firm in your own mind. Five, belief for fear. As we pointed out in other sections of this book, and also in other books of this series, the mental state known as confident expectation exerts a powerful dynamic force in the direction of attracting or drawing to the individual the objects or things which form the subject of a strong faith and hope. This path was found active in the case before us, by the case of odd induction. The person who earnestly expects, hopes, and believes that the positive and the contagious for hearts of others will reach and influence them, undoubtedly sets into operation of subtle forces, which attract and draw such to him. Likewise, the individual who strongly fears and therefore expects confidently that the adverse, making advance of others, will reach and affect him. He fully draws and attracts to himself that which he so strongly fears. In either case, the principle of his level of confident expectation, in each case, there is present a strong faith or belief, which in one case is accompanied by hope, and in the other, by dread. In thought, at the lowest, faith, hope, and fear, dread, are perceived to be the opposite poles 
of the one mental state, the mental state of confident expectation. Each pole is possessed of a strong drawn power or childhood force. These draws to itself are objects or conditions corresponding to the thought. This realization of the central identity of the two apparent opposites will be found to furnish the means of the reconciliation of the two facts, seemingly opposed to each other, which for so long has perplexed and disturbed the students of mental science. The first phase of the power of confident expectation, i.e., the of faith hold, is illustrated in the many cases of a mental healing or similar forms of mental or spiritual therapeutics, in which sick persons, by their earnest faith and hope, attract and draw to themselves the healing thought and mental patterns of the healer or person during the treatment, which thought influences and during serve to arouse within the patient his own recuperative force of energy, and thus to bring about a cure. The same principle operates in cases of treatments for improved conditions, which result in a weakening the attractive mental forces of the individual himself, thus bringing about the desired improvement according to well established psychological laws. Thus, faith and hope are powerful local states capable of affecting important results. The second phase of the power of confident expectation, i.e., that of clear dread is still stated in the many cases of persons affected by their belief in adverse treatments, religious magnetism, black magic, which have in so long. The history of psychology and mental science contains numerous instances in which persons have been seriously injured in health, and in some cases have actually died, by reason of their belief in the power of evil and merit in the adverse parts of the worse. Here, the view of dread has argued in the same way as does faith hope, both being phases of confident expectation. That is to say, it has the chances of a person, the evil influences which were dreaded, and the evil effects which were feared. Here, the thing I feared has come upon me. There is nothing strange in the matter once the principle is understood. No one only saw the faith hope in the good. It would banish his fear of our dread of the evil. Need ever suffer from any of the adverse mental influences above mentioned. This is a true which is does not set me free from the curse of air. The five rules of thought induction which we have just called to your attention will be found present and operative in practically all phenomenal thought power in all of its many phases. You will do well to study each very carefully.